America's the greatest country in the world. Good morning. Welcome to Breitbart News Daily. Mike Slater, thanks for being here. Streaming also on uh, the First TV, firsttv.com, and the First TV app, a direct TV channel 347, everywhere else you stream. Grateful you're here. Also grateful that Charlie Spearing is here. Washington reporter, author of the new book, Amateur Hour, Kamala Harris in the White House. Charlie, how you doing, sir? Great, Mike. Great to be back. I'm really good to talk to him. So when you read, uh, when we all read um, Alex Marlowe's book about breaking Biden, about Joe Biden, he really changed the narrative about Joe Biden. I think a lot of people fell for this whole thing of, oh, he's just a, a doddering old man in his basement and um, you know, Uncle Joe and the affable gaff master. Uncle. And Alex's thesis is like, no, no, <laughs> no, no. Like he knows what he's doing very powerful uh and you don't trip and fall and step on rakes all the way to the white house that was that was the thesis and i think that's wise is that true for kamala harris well mike that's not exactly true with kamala harris she has sort of she's a very ambitious politician and so and she's willing to sort of do or say or change however she needs to be to you know, achieved additional levels of power. You know, but she's kind of a story of how you can kind of fail upward, even though you're not succeeding in every single job. If you're cautious enough, if you're careful enough, if you're, you know, if you have that ability to reverse yourself on, on key positions and position yourself, then, you know, you might just find your way, you know, failing up. And that's certainly yeah, what so she, does, she did throughout so her whole she, career. She, she did trip and fall on rakes all the way up into the potentially almost the white house. Like, oh man, unbelievable how that's possible. How far back do you go in your book uh, with her ambitions? Yeah, well, I start at the very beginning. You know, looking at you know her parents, where she was born, um, mm. her early life, moving into you know politics, uh, how she first got her start, and in, in San Francisco. And, you know, her experience with, with Willie Brown. And, you know, it's important to take a good look at that. That really explains a lot of how she got her start to power. And all I'm the way sad. up until she won her, you know, district attorney seat, that race, what she had to do to win that race, moving on to attorney general. And then finally winning a, you know, a pretty easy Senate race in California and winning at the same time as, President Donald Trump won in 2016, and then coming to Washington, um, really sort of creating this persona, you know, this this person that would go viral and fight Trump at every at every turn, and then leverage that, you know, just a couple years in the Senate to launch her presidential campaign. Yeah, and then of course we one... take a long time to, you know, going through her presidential campaign and how, what a disaster that was. And then the certain set of circumstances that led her to be the ultimate choice for Joe Biden as who's running. What an unbelievable story. And we don't know the end of it yet, but there is a possibility that she becomes president of the United States. Like that's not totally out of the realm possibility, which is crazy. So we really need to know this woman, this person. I like starting from the beginning. I like hearing about people's childhoods and people's parents. I think that explains a lot, potentially. What do we need to know about her mom and dad? Well, if you ask her, she'll tell this story on the campaign trail about how she was raised uh, marching and shouting for justice. According to Kamala Harris, she was raised in a very vibrant civil rights society. But when you sort of do the research, there were more successful academics, you know, both her mom and her dad were of idealistic academics and at, at, you know, college. And then, you know, they, their relationship did not last long. You know, they divorced, separated when she was just a young girl. So that mm-hmm. sort of separated her from her father, who is a bit more of a radical and described as a Marxist in, in many circles. Her parents were both members of the, this uh, study group that, in Berkeley that was very radical. Um, so it was, a, it was a very, very sort of busy childhood, but she certainly didn't sort of go through this idea of, of struggle, of how of somehow she was this uh, 
this victim of, of racism and bad society in California. I mean, California is a pretty progressive place. Yeah, so her dad was a Marxist, super, uh, and both academics. What, what were they doing in their adulthood for jobs? Her father was an economics professor, and her mother was a cancer researcher. Um, so they were both uh, pretty pretty successful, but you know her father wasn't around much after the divorce, and she was mostly raised by her mother. It was kind of a more practical, professional, no nonsense type person. Did she have a Did she have a stepdad? Did any male figure in her life growing up? That's what's curious. She did. It, she doesn't. Her mother never remarried, and it doesn't seem like she she was definitely raised in a sort of a house of, you know, tough, determined women who are, who are sort of convinced to keep keep uh, going through their lives and, and that's not necessarily relying on a, a male figure throughout their life. Do we know why she decided to get into politics in the first place? Well, she certainly got the experience of, you know, caught the, the, the politics bug, I suppose you could say, um, after she started dating Willie Brown. She met him, and when she was just, a, you know, an Almeda County prosecutor, and she got to experience, you know, when she dated Willie Brown, Willie Brown was running for mayor. And so she got to experience all the, the power and the trappings of power all throughout that year. They did, they only dated a year, but she got to experience, like, all the, the power and glory of what it what it's like to be a politician in California. So I, I so real, think that real, was, we, um, I know Willie Brown. So we, people, need, maybe people may not know Willie Brown. How would you best describe Willie Brown other than kind of like a wacky black civil rights leader, mayor of San Francisco? Yeah, Willie Brown is a character. He was one of the most powerful black politicians in American history. He sort of moved comfortably and throughout different political circles and sort of wielded power and influence in a way that was very, very, pow- very, very powerful and effective. But he also had a, like a whiff of corruption around him. But, you know, he was investigated by the FBI several times, um, but it was never charged or was never caught doing anything, you know, unsavory. So he's a very nimble and effective politician. You know, President Bill Clinton met him and, and uh, described him as the real Slick Willie. Was a, was a very experienced, very powerful individual. He was, you know, sort of in charge of the entire California legislature before he was eventually sort of forced out because of term limits. And that's when he decided to run for mayor of San Francisco. And what did, how did she, how did he help her get her political start? Well, he really opened all the doors, right? If, if you're Willie Brown's girlfriend for about a year, then you get to meet the most powerful, influential people in California. No joke. Very easy. And so by opening all those doors, when, it, when Kamala Harris felt it was time to run for district attorney, everyone knew who she was. And all she had to do was prove that she was capable and smart enough to get out there and, and run a race against a very unpopular a very unpopular district attorney in in San Francisco at the time, Terrence Hollinan. So he he was already very unpopular because of his progressive politics. Kind of we're kind of leading San Francisco down the wrong path, and people wanted something different. Here we are back again. Uh, we'll get away from the dating life, although the story of her dating Willie Brown is like the most important story of of Kamala Harris's life, I would argue. Um, but there's a weird video that I pops up every once in a while of her going to like some premiere or something on a red carpet with Montel Williams. And it's like her and another woman and Montel. Like, like what, what is that? Yeah, they dated for a short time. And that was one of the rare occasions where she went public as a, with, you know, a, a boyfriend. And, it, you know, she kind of resisted having relationships in the public eye. And she talked about how she never really felt comfortable because of all the questions that were brought up. But yeah, they, they dated for a short time and that one sort of appeared in, in social society together. But yeah, after that, there were no uh, sort of significant others for, for a long time throughout her, the rest of her political career. Who is the other girl? Is this, oh, it's his daughter. Okay. 
See, you guys, you can't assume the worst all the time. So it's Montel, his daughter, <laughs> and uh, and uh, and Kamala here. How bizarre! It's like one of those weird trippy things. You're like, wait, what? Like, whoever saw this girl with Montel Williams, woman, and thinking, oh, one day she'll be vice president, maybe <laughs> president. Like, super weird. Um, okay, so I want to know the story, and we'll save the rest for the book. But how she went from the like z- absolute zero on the presidential uh, campaign. And, and she, her, own, her only moment was when she ripped on Joe Biden out of nowhere for supporting you know, busing or illegal, whatever. And she like came hard at Joe that one time to then being vice president. How did she get the VP nod? Yeah, it was a very difficult decision for, for Biden, for the whole family. You know, obviously Biden's advisors and, and even President, former President Obama himself were like, look, you know, this is, this is the person you want. She's a, she's a, She's a woman. She's black. She'll connect with voters. Um, she's been through the ringer. She, you know, she, there won't be too many surprises. She's already been vetted, but really, she wasn't. And she sort of ran a lackluster mm-hmm. campaign. She dropped out before voters even got to deliver a verdict. And so, a big part of the narrative at that time, remember that Joe Biden said in one of the last primary debates, he said, "I commit that I will choose a woman as vice president." And then as, as the summer of rage went on, you know, the George Floyd riots and, and all of that, and a lot of these sort of racial issues facing the entire country, um, you saw sort of the consensus go to, well, we have to pick a, a black woman to, you know, heal the, heal the nation. And so you saw at the top of the list the number of black women that he was looking at. And certainly Susan Rice was surprisingly one of the top candidates to be VP. Um, I reveal in the book that, you know, Susan Rice was Joe Biden's favorite. Um, and, and you would, you know, conservatives who would think, why would you pick Susan Rice? She's the face of the Benghazi disaster. She, she did terrible as, as Obama's national security advisor, but they actually, during that time when Biden was serving with Obama, he had developed a pretty good rapport with Susan Rice and they actually got along. Another choice they had was um, Karen Bass, representative mm-hmm. at the time, but she was on the record, you know, as being a you know literal Castro supporter throughout her, her political career. Not so good for vice presidential material. And look, Kamala's team made sure that, you know, the entire media and the entire Biden team knew about these other top women um, and knew about their, their problems and just made sure everybody knew all about it. And somehow they ended up Bass, coming down to this. Karen Bass, by the Kamala way. Kamala was the best. Karen Bass, Karen Bass, by the way, now the mayor of Los Angeles. So it's very interesting. So where DeSantis, one would argue, had bad timing. Kamala had perfect timing. Just <laughs> couldn't have timed it any better for her to get that V spot, VP spot. Unbelievable. Um, you mentioned that Obama said, "Oh, you know, she's uh, accomplished and she's been through the ringer." Uh, I would argue that she has not been through the ringer. She's never been properly vetted. Uh, she made it through her entire California political career without any hard questioning from a very uh, hapless media in California. And, and still, I think that is true, even on the national stage, um, never really given a, a proper vetting and maybe president one day, which is wild. What do you want, the most important thing you want people to know from reading your book? What's that? What's the most important thing you want people to walk away with after reading your book? Yeah, I think it's uh, the most important thing is to, be, to look at Kamala Harris, her career, what she's done, why is she a heartbeat away from the presidency? I want people to understand exactly who she is because the national media hasn't done a very good job explaining who she is and she hasn't been thoroughly vetted. And if she was ever to run for president herself, she would maybe she, you know, an, an actual campaign that where she would actually be competitive, maybe there would be a little more scrutiny on her record. But at this point, it's important for Americans to know exactly who she is because she may not have to win an election to be your next president. And so, you know, people, why are we writing about, why are we writing a book about Kamala Harris, the vice president? Because she's the only one in, in modern history that could very well be the next president of the United States. 
you know, Al Gore never had that problem, right? He, he, mm. he was, Bill Clinton was very young and vivacious. He wasn't going anywhere. Yeah. But with Joe Biden in the current state that he's in, um, it's important for all Americans to understand exactly who Kamala Harris is and how she got there. Especially if, heaven forbid, Biden were to win this next election, then it's almost guaranteed that she'd be uh, the, the president for a time. That's unbelievable. Uh, Charlie Spearing, the book is called Amateur Hour, Kamala Harris in the White House. Charlie, great to talk to you, brother. Appreciate it. You bet. Thanks for having me on. 866-95-PATRIOT. Ooh, sorry. I'm just having, I'm having visions of that happening. <laughs> oh, man. Oh, Trump must win. 866-95-PATRIOT. Mike Slater, Breitbart News Daily. Spread the word. Oh, <laughs>